Good afternoon, everyone. This is Elliot Meyer. I'm the Communications Coordinator for Wisconsin Land and Water. I'm so pleased to welcome you to the second breakout session in our very first virtual county conservation meeting. Before I give the introductions of our presenters, uh, I just wanted again to give you a big thank you to the Extension for their time and technical support. I also wanted to say that none of this would have been possible without the hard work of our colleague, Christina Anderson, who worked tirelessly over the past two weeks to make this county con meeting happen virtually. So thank you both so very much. Um, now, just to make sure that everyone is in the right place, uh, this is the main breakout room and this session is entitled Conservation Across Wisconsin. And as the communications coordinator, I'm particularly excited about this session, the work that our members do from relationship building, cost sharing, uh, public education, installing soft and hard practices, um, all of it um, is essentially the keystone to the value of our conservation apparatus across Wisconsin. Um, and, uh, you can see this work um, in our Conservation Across Wisconsin map and our success stories, which is uh, um, things that I coordinate through our association. Um, and this is a strong representation of the different kinds of programs and projects that our conservation departments do each year. Um, I'm gonna provide the links uh, to those resources in the chat box momentarily. Um, and if you're a county conservation employee, please consider submitting your work to us and we'll post it on the map and we'll share it on social media. So, okay, that's my shameless plug. <laughs> and uh, now to our presenters. Today we have, uh, today we are pleased to have Chad Sampson from Racine County and Tina Barone from Dunn County share with us two great conservation stories that highlight the work that our, our, that our county conservation departments do across the state each year. Chad Sampson is the conservationist for Racine County Land Conservation Department. He will be talking with us today about Racine County's successful tree program sales, uh, the way the program's grown and how it's enabled the department to engage with the public. Tita Barone is a graduate from UW River Falls with a degree in crop and soil and has 15 years of experience of environmental work in the public and private sectors. And for the past three years, she has served as the conservation planner for Dunn County's Land Water Conservation Division. Tina enjoys assisting landowners uh, with constructing engineering projects and adopting soft conservation practices on the land. So Chad and Tina, please go ahead and unmute yourselves if you haven't already. And as you present, make sure you say next slide and I will advance the slide forward. I will give a five minute notice if needed at the end so we can wrap up and have some time for questions. And as a reminder to the audience, um, same as before, please send all of your questions today through the chat box. So without further ado, I will turn the presentation over to Chad and Tina. Um, take it away. Hi, Chad Sampson here with the uh, Racine County Land Conservation Division. Um, I've been with the county 22 years, the county conservation since uh, 2007. We've run a tree program or tree sale since the um, early 1980s. And um, I'm just gonna explain what we do. And the photo on the original slide here is a white pine that we sold probably five years ago when the farmers was bragging how well it was doing when I was out there this year. So next slide. So just kind of an overview of what a tree program is or tree sale is. It gives the landowners an opportunity to purchase large quantities, quantities of trees for conservation. Um, we sell tree, we get the trees from nurseries in Michigan. We have three nurseries we typically get them from. We typically have 300 customers each year. About, we sell about 35,000 trees. Now these are seedling trees. They, they come about 12 inches to maybe up to two feet, but mostly 12 to 18 inches, 15 inches plus our sizes. <clears throat> so what I do is I contact the nursery, see what's available, um, put together an order form. It's not the same every year, but it doesn't vary too much. And then uh, we work with USDA Farm Service Agency on a newsletter. Uh, they're willing to share their um, customer list or their address list. So we have actually our FSA is a part of Milwaukee, Racine, and Kenosha counties. So I have the benefit of getting 5,000 rural landowners our tree order form by mailing each year. Next. We also um, have a press release that goes out <clears throat> through the county executive's office. He's very supportive of the program. 
We put the tree sale on the website so people can order online. Um, we also have an email list of previous customers, so they also get an email um, copy letting them know the order form is available. Our ordering deadline is the end of February, so a bunch of orders come in the last, you know, the last minute, the last two weeks. And then um, I contact the nurseries with some final numbers. Hopefully they're close to the reserve numbers. And then on March 1st, if everybody says they have everything and all the orders are in and everything's good, and then I just kind of wait for about a month and a half to, to uh, distribute the trees. But this year, right around March 1st, as we all know, the um, COVID-19, or at that time, the coronavirus, whatever you want to call it, was starting to make its way um, in the news daily. And, uh, but nothing had really quite happened yet. Next slide, please. So myself, I'm a basketball fan, college basketball fan. I usually go out to Vegas the first week of March. So I went out to Las Vegas, and there was still college basketball. There was still professional basketball. Sports was still happening. And I took that photo in the middle while I was out there. Their basketball had shut down while I was there. Baseball was delayed two weeks, obviously longer than that. Um, that little red ball up in the corner is not the coronavirus. It's actually a cat toy, but it's my cat's favorite toy, so I'll put it on there. But anyways, um, yeah, so I was seeing the world change while I was actually in a different part of the world. Next slide, please. So I got back to the office, and then March 18th, Racine County had closed all offices to the public. Um, staff was directed to alternate working at the office and at home. So we have about 25 office staff, not land conservation staff, but office staff in the public works, zoning, planning, some park staff that have offices, accounting people, secretaries. Um, so we have about 25 people. We are kind of informed to be about 10 to 12 in the office um, per day. And then we kind of social distance at that point. And I guess what was crossing my mind is what are we gonna do about the tree program? I mean, are we still gonna have it? Should I just cancel it? Um, and typically in our tree program, what happens is the trees are out in a building on a county um, property. And then the customer comes during any time that um, we schedule them, usually a Tuesday afternoon or a Wednesday all day. They can come anytime they want. They come in the building, give a staff person a seat. And there can be anywhere from 10 to 15 to 20 people in, time, in the building at a time. And we, it's a good time for a PR for our department. It's a good time to just talk about planting trees and what they're trying to do. Um, so it's a very positive opportunity. But I knew that with the whole COVID-19 coming that this customer interaction wasn't gonna be the same. But I was thinking to myself, could we still, still run the program? Next slide, please. So um, we were thinking, how do we space out customers? We have to pre-bag all the orders, um, masks or no masks. I mean, am I gonna need more staff? So all these questions are kind of coming, popping into my head because um, 300 customers over a day and a half is a, is a lot of people. And I just was trying to figure out exactly, exactly how we were gonna handle the situation. So we, we came up with the, the curbside pickup and that's uh, what we were gonna roll with. And then I had to kind of figure out how we're gonna separate all the, all the customers, all, all the cars come in. We can't have them come all in at once. So next slide, please. Oh yeah, then people are calling and they're asking, are we still having the program? Um, we, we're still doing this and I would tell people yes your receipts are coming in the mail there may be some additional instructions for how we're gonna handle it uh, we put that on the website and um, so yeah there was two people that actually called one called and just said they didn't want to do the program they didn't want their order so they wanted a refund and another person called and they said they just wanted to donate their trees they didn't want to come out so people are still afraid to actually you know, come outside and interact with other people um, so anyway next slide please so on the right, uh, the white page is the normal receipt that people see. And I kind of find that if you send the people the same thing year after year, they know what it is right away. They know how to, you know, how to respond to it and react. So we, we haven't changed that too much over the years. But this year I added an orange page, so bright orange to make it a little more uh, noticeable. And I gave people um, certain times and dates for pickup. And on the bottom it says, do not enter the building. So people can get out of your car, you can check your order, but we don't want, we don't want people in the building with, with staff. Next slide, please. So how our tree program works is our trees are delivered on Monday, usually late afternoon into the evening. They're left in a refrigerated truck overnight. 
staff goes out to the building um, the next morning and we unload and sort the trees Tuesday morning. And normally there's three land conservation staff and one zoning staff that I have help. And uh, we, we sell the trees over, or deliver the trees over a period of two days. Um, but this year I, I knew we were gonna need more help because normally the customer comes in the building and we walk with them to each station and, and show them the trees and put them in the bag. And they're kind of actually kind of helping because they're in there, they're asking questions. But I knew this year we weren't doing that. So I, I just kind of wanted to have a couple additional staff. So two parks guys that normally just mow lawns at parks, um, they were asked to help us out for a couple days. Next slide, please. And also this year we started to pre-bag the orders, which we haven't done before. So we were, um, orders one through 10 were bagged up and they were scheduled to be do the tree pickup from one till 1.30, 11 to 20 were scheduled to 1.30 to two. So we could kind of keep, keep up with the, the people that were coming in. There were some people like order number 186 comes in at you know, one o'clock on the first day, but you know, we just, we just made do and we just went and prepared an order and brought it all to them. Next slide, please. Oh yeah, masks or no masks. So I was kind of debating because we were, we were outside, you're approaching a person's car, but you know, we're not. And then I thought, well, because masks weren't quite everywhere yet, but they were getting to be more, more popular. So I had had, had some masks made and um, I hadn't made the decision until the first person came up. So the first gentleman drive up to the program, he's a, a larger gentleman in a, in a minivan, a little bit older gentleman. He rolled down his window about a half an inch and slid his receipt through. I knew we were wearing masks after that point. So I told all the staff, if you're going to approach a customer in a vehicle, you're going to have a mask on. If you were in the building or outside, we were trying to social distance while we were outside, um, you didn't need to wear one. But actually, those two days that we did the delivery, it was fairly cold out. It was just about 40 degrees. So actually, the mask kind of helped keep your face warm. So it wasn't as big a deal. Next. So what were the positive outcomes? So <clears throat> as anybody, any county that has a tree program knows that people are usually pretty excited to come get their trees and they can get outside and plant with their kids or plant with the grandkids or, um, yeah, people are pretty upbeat and excited about the program. This year I had so many people thank me for still having the program even though the COVID-19 was, um, was still very alive and, and, and well and, and people hadn't been getting outside and doing things like this. So um yeah so people were excited about it more than more than ever um it helped a lot that the customers were coming during their time slot i mean a few didn't but some people would call and get a little bit angry they'd be like well my time slot's one o'clock till 1 30 but we're still working i said you can come anytime after you're done with work we'll still be there so we, we got explained um the, this year was the first time we actually had to go outside during the program if it was raining out so you can send newer staff outside to help customers if, if you want to do that. I thought that was okay. Um, the additional park staff, staff was extremely helpful. I mean, you don't realize how many, getting two extra bodies in there, an extra set of hands, a couple extra sets of hands working on those trees, getting things packaged up would, would, would help. And honestly, um, I'm not sure, but we might run this program just like this in the future, uh, curbside pickup. So um, that's, I think, all I have. Next. Thank you. I'm presenting on behalf of the Dunn County Land and Water Conservation Division. We're presenting about some successes we had in a small watershed in the county. The projects that I'll cover are likely similar to what most county conservation programs our offices are doing, um, but we really wanted to highlight the relationships and the trust built in getting conservation on the land. Next. Dunn County is located in the northwestern corner of the state. It includes seven incorporated villages and one city. Menominee is located about an hour east of Minneapolis-St. Paul and 30 minutes west of Eau Claire. The population of Menominee is 16,000 and it includes a lot of historic buildings like the Mabel Tainter Theater and that's located in the downtown historic district. Menominee is also home to UW Stout and Lakes Tainer and Lake Minoman. Um, the lakes were created when dams were built on the Red Cedar River and especially locally they garner a lot of attention because they're green and they're smelly and is due to algae growth. In the late 1800s a lot of logging occurred in the Red Cedar watershed and that cleared a lot of land that was then converted into farmland. Next. 
Agriculture in Dunn County makes up 35.5% of the land cover, according to the WIS land study, and 1,001 farms were documented in the 2010 census. We have five CAFOs, and agriculture provides 17% of the jobs in the county workforce and 10.6 million in local and state taxes. The crops generally grown in Dunn County are corn for grain and silage, soybeans, hay, small grains, kidney beans, and potatoes. Since the lakes draw a lot of attention in Dunn County, it's really easy to focus conservation on the Red Cedar watershed where the lakes are and kind of overlook and maybe neglect a little bit some of the smaller watersheds. Next. One of those smaller watersheds is the Knights Creek watershed. Knights Creek is located in southwestern Dunn County. It flows southeasterly to the O'Galley River, then to the Chippewa River, and then finally to the Mississippi River. Next. The Knights Creek watershed has had a lot of conservation efforts in the past. In 1959, an effort was started to address frequent flood water damage to agricultural interests. In the past, there was destruction of crops, fences, roads, and bridges. So in 1960, an application was submitted for the Watershed Protection and Flood Prevention Act, PL 566, also known as the Small Watershed Program. Through this program, the Federal Agency Soil Conservation Service, now known as the Natural Resources Conservation Service, assisted project sponsors like Dunn County to develop watershed plans and technical and financial assistance to implement practices in those plans. The documented land uses in 1964 for this watershed were 50% cropland, 20% pasture, 24% woodland, and 6% other like roads and houses. So in 1967, construction started on three dam structures. Next. The dams were built for flood control. They were hoping to reduce flash flooding by implementing both conservation plans, plans for how the cropland was going to be run above the dams and also the three dam structures. In the map, you can see purple numbers and circles. Those are identifying the three dam locations. Um, these dams are considered high hazard dams because they have a potential to flood dwellings downstream. According to the USDA Soil Conservation Service Project Completion Report dated June 1, 1972, the towns of Weston and Dunn saved an estimated $4,000 in road repairs after heavy rains on June 8, 1970 because of the flood control structures. Next. This is a picture of Dam 1. It's one of the structures that was built. Dam 1 has an embankment height of 36 feet vertically, 770 feet long embankment, and includes 1,960 acres that drain into it. You can see it's still functioning for flood control today. In the lower left-hand corner is a picture of the dam after an October 2007 rain event. And then uh, earlier they mentioned how in the northwest part of the state we got a big rainfall um, at the end of June. In the upper right hand corner is a picture of the dam after that rain. We ended up only locally in this township getting about four inches of rainfall. But you can see that our dams are have a lot more capacity to hold water in them um, than just this four inch rainfall. The land use has changed somewhat in this watershed from where it was in 1960, um, but it's more the land, it's more how, how we lost animals in the watershed um, because people are more having more row crops and less animals now. Next. One problem we really have though, especially with Dam 1, is excessive sediment is coming into the pool area of the dam. In, if you look at the picture in the lower right hand corner, you can see the trash guard or trash rack and it's, it's basically like that cage and that cage is meant to protect the pipe and the pipe is just past that lower right hand side of your photo. The sediment in this picture is being removed with a backhoe bucket and that cut right there is about a four foot cut. So we have a lot of sediment being deposited here. It's threatening to bury that pipe and also block fish passage because this is a trout stream. Also on top of that, 
Dunn County is responsible for the maintenance and the repairs for this structure. So it's getting to be very costly to remove sediment every year or two. It's really in our best interest to start looking at the watershed and seeing what we can do to reduce that sediment load from coming from upstream. And farming has changed a lot since the 1960s and the conservation plans that once were written are not being followed anymore. And for that matter, the local trust um, and relationships that once were built in this watershed has dwindled over time. Next. So we started working with Beverly upstream. Beverly is a landowner. She rents out the cropland and she admitted to us that she knew little about farming. So we described to her the issues we were seeing on her farm. On the upper right hand corner of the screen, you'll see a wooded gully that's eating into the cropland. And then on the lower left hand side of your screen, you see the crop field recently tilled, not a whole lot of cover on it. And that's what it was looking like most of the year. So we explained to her how we calculated the current cropland erosion and it was two to three times the tolerable soil loss and the tolerable soil loss is the amount of soil that can be lost per year and still retain the crop production. So a lot of that or that all that sediment was going right down into dam one and Beverly thought that that wasn't very sustainable and that wasn't something she wanted her land doing. So she did want to try to make a change. Um, we designed a grade stabilization structure to address the wooded gully um, on the upper right. And then the cropland management was a little bit more difficult. So Beverly set up a meeting with her operator and land and water conservation to sit at her kitchen table and hash out some different options and what we might be able to do out there. <laughs> Changes are really hard for anyone. But asking a farmer to change farming practices in today's dynamic and difficult farming economy is even harder. Um, oftentimes trust needs to be built with time and connecting with others before changes can really be made. Um, you know, as conservationists, we take things for granted like Russell too. What we use to calculate soil loss, you know, we just assume that it, it, it knows what it's doing and we don't have to justify that it is properly calculating soil erosion until we're questioned on it and then we have to go and look up all the background stuff on it. But th those are some of the things that we sometimes encounter, you know, there were a variety of emotions that were expressed during our meetings at the kitchen table. The situation was difficult and oftentimes uncomfortable. But, next slide. We did come to an agreement. It took a lot of work, but we did. <laughs> and we wanted to make sure we got a document that documented that the cropland would be operated at or below the tolerable soil loss. And this document we use on a regular basis. Um, it emphasizes continued conversations with all the parties and the plan can be adapted as we change. And we really want to make sure that that operators know that, that they know that they're not stuck with this forever. Um, but we do require with all waterways and all grade stabilization structures that they prove that everything under the landowner's control is operated at or below T. It just saves us from having our structures filled in with a bunch of sediment. And on top of that, it really just gets more conservation on the land. I mean, sometimes it's, it's easy to pair the two together. Um, so during this process, the operator did also bring up the neighbor upstream. And he said, well, the neighbor upstream, you know, he's got a waterway and it's not in very good shape and it's bringing down a bunch of sediment and a bunch of corn stalks. And, you know, I think you should work with him. And he said, well, I, I do have his phone number. So he said he would work on contacting that landowner upstream. Next. So we started working on implementation. You can see in the upper, upper right hand side of your screen that there's a lot more green there than there was in the previous picture. He's growing a lot of hay in the rotation. In the far background, you can see there are some row crops, but after our last four inch rain, there were no gullies present. He has been following his conservation plan. He's done everything we've asked him to do, so he's, he's doing great. Then in the lower left-hand side corner, or 
corner of your screen, you'll see the grade stabilization structure. Um, that's a few years after it was built. It's holding some water and the wildlife really love it. I scared some ducks off of it when I was there not too long ago. And another good thing happened with that is during construction, the neighbor upstream with the waterway, Roger, he stopped out and we had some really good conversations about waterways and about cover crops and no-till and nutrient management. And he decided that he would want our help to do a waterway upstream too. Next. So we worked on a waterway upstream with him. And this is the finished product of the waterway. There are berms around it, so you can kind of see that we use temporary berms the first year to keep most of the water out of the channel so that we can get grass to establish. And then the second year, we push those berms out and the channel's ready to take the full flow. Roger appeared to be pretty happy with what we'd done because he said, you know, can we take a tour? And, and I'll show you different parts of my farm and, and you can see what you can help me with. So we went on a tour of his farm and we looked at a bunch of different areas and he wanted to do some waterways. But when we looked at the upstream coming into his waterways, this is what we saw. Next. This was his neighbor upstream and his neighbor upstream what, you know, had some issues that he needed to deal with. So after some time, we got into contact with this landowner. His name is Justin. And Justin admitted that he'd been really struggling trying to get a waterway to establish in this area. He said he tried several years and he thought there was just too much water coming down and the soils weren't good enough and he just was never going to succeed at it. So when we offered to assist him, he was thankful to accept. Um, we did talk a little bit at this time about his cropland practices and he was a low T at that time. Next. So here are some pictures of his waterway after construction. In the lower left hand side you'll see that it does have that temporary berm on it and then in the upper right hand side you can see after the berm was removed and he had planted the crops this waterway after the last four inch rain had no evidence of erosion it no water was even ponded in it it, it everything was functioning just the way it should and justin actually asked for assistance on some additional waterways after this um, and of course these projects often take multiple years and and you get to know the people you're working with more and more throughout the process and justin was very open about what he was doing in his fields um, next. He had transitioned to no-till a few years before I started working with him and he said that he transitioned because he was sick of the expense and the hassle of hauling tillage equipment around and then once he tried it he was hooked. He said he wasn't going to go back. He also did decide to try cover crops as well and he had been planting cereal rye in the fall and one spring he went to plant his corn and he hadn't gotten out to spray the rye yet it was 14 inches tall so he just no-tilled his corn directly into the 14 inch tall living standing rye and then he sprayed it off and on the right hand side of the picture you can see that dead rye um, all over the surface and his corn plants popping right up. He said that he had the highest yield he's ever had on this farm after he did this and that he was definitely going to try it again because it was too good of a deal um, to pass up. So Justin being who he is and he always wants to share with others, you know, we talked a lot about different things and he wanted to share with his neighbors. Next. So his neighbor downstream decided after all of the talk and everything that he would want to, he wanted to try no-till too. So he's working on no-till and then decides, well, how about cover crops too? So he, he started working on, on converting his land over to no-till and cover crops. The one thing that I think we sometimes take for granted is there's a learning curve with anything. Anytime you adapt any new practice, there's going to be somewhat of a learning curve and encouraging people to talk to their neighbors, talk to other farmers, talk to, talk to anybody, watch YouTube videos, you know, whatever it takes to try to flatten that learning curve because they need to also be 
supporting themselves during this time. Next. So we finally got back to doing Rogers waterways that were below Justin's and those were completed this spring. And you can see the vegetation's coming up um, in them. It, there's no, there is earthen berms, but we seeded the earthen berms on this one to try to reduce the amount of weeds coming up on the berms and also to try to protect against erosion on the outside of the berms. We often do see erosion on the outside of the berms, but we figure it's temporary loss for long-term gain because we're getting that good take on the vegetation inside. But honestly, seeding the berms is the best of both worlds. So I think we're gonna do that again. Um, while out in the watershed recently, another landowner approached us and, and wanted to work with us and wanted to help us. And I think we've gotten to the point where we're, we're accepted in the watershed. We've built up enough trust. I think people don't see us as the dirt cops anymore. They see us as a people out there trying to help them. So I feel like we're gonna have continued success here. Um, Throughout the process, we had many discussions about Wisconsin runoff rules for farmers and NR 151 compliance. But at the end of the day, all of the practices were voluntary. No enforcement actions or threats were taken. Next. Building relationships, trust and respect with landowners and operators, hours of boots on the ground and word of mouth between neighbors has allowed cons continued conservation in the watershed. An estimated 1,000 tons of soil per year will remain in place because of the practices implemented the, by the landowners and operators in Knights Creek Watershed. Some of our future projects um, later this year and beyond would be additional waterways, manure pit closures, grade stabilization structures, nutrient management plans, no-till, and cover crops. Next. This was a group effort. Land and water conservation cannot take credit for all of it. Landowners and operators' willingness to try new things and then discuss it with their neighbors has contributed greatly. I'd just like to close with a quote. Individually, we are one drop. Together, we are an ocean. Thank you. All right. Thank you both so very much. Um, that was uh, both both presentations were absolutely fascinating. Um, as a reminder to anyone in the audience, uh, continue to send questions through the chat box. Uh, you can either do it to me directly or to everyone. Um, uh, we had two two questions come in. Um, the the first one I'm gonna I'm gonna throw out to to Tina. So, you know. Uh, it's, it's amazing to me that, you know, there's this notion that you can't teach an old dog new tricks. And so um, I think what your story proves in the Knights Creek watershed is that you can, in fact, help people at every different stage of farming or life come to a different understanding um, or, or way of doing something. So, but the question is, is, is really, you know, what were some of the conventional farming practices that you were confronted with? Um, were, th were there any specific ones in particular that you can remember were, were hard to work through and how did you get there? Well, at one point in the conversation, it was brought up that, uh, you know, the person I was working with, their dad, Mobor plowed and the, the son said he thought he was a god when he got the chisel plow because, you know, he was saving so much, so much soil erosion. So, um, you know, we're dealing with where you know spring and fall cultivation is is just really not cutting it and yeah maybe his dad moldboard plowed and maybe it stayed in place but his dad had a lot more years of hay in the rotation and at this point we've got such a hard pan in the soil that you know the water doesn't infiltrate like it used to they they have a lot of ponding on the surface so it, we had some some issues with that, but really, once once we got over that first hump, we kind of started seeing people being a lot more willing to change things. But that the first the first site was really hard, and and that one it was it was just getting over that the chisel plow wasn't the best type of tillage out there. It wasn't the most soil conserving uh, piece of equipment. 
Sure. Um, great. Thank you. Uh, the second question is for Chad. Um, and it's, uh, do you have any advice for counties who don't have a tree program but are looking to start one? And how can you grow uh, public awareness and support for something like well, like I said, we use the uh, USDA's um, farm service list. They said as long as they send an, uh, an email out or a, um, a notice out, either by hard mailing or an e email, that as long as they have a message, we can have our message with them. So that was our initial um, contact, I guess, or, or the first time that uh, we had had you know, 5,000 people get a, get a letter in the mail or a, a tree order form in the mail with a newsletter. Um, that's the easiest way because that's your rural community. Um, people that have land and probably want more than just one or two trees, they want 25 at a time. Besides that, <clears throat> we were thinking about even doing a radio address. Um, it goes on the front page of the county's website for about two or three days. That's not too bad either. So those are a couple different ways that I could see people getting started. Okay. Um, and uh, a follow-up question to that too is: um, uh, Has this? Uh, have you noticed there's been an uptick, an uptick in uh, the level of engagement from the public and racine uh, when it, regarding um, invasive species, or you know, uh, looking to do other conservation practices or things on their land, even if they're not a farmer? Yeah, I would say um, with the when the online sale became available. Um, they start clicking around the website and they might look and see what else you have going on. And then you get some random phone calls from people that didn't even know our department existed. And um, yeah, it could just be a general conversation about what else they can do on their property or just, you know, more about the, the tree program itself. It, it kind of goes hand in hand. You know, they'll, they'll talk to you about any, any topic that they have that they have an issue on their property. They want to make some improvements. So yes, definitely um, the online sales because people actually go to the website or click on that link, and um, that does make a difference when they're, when they're clicking on your land conservation website. Great, thanks. Um, the, the next question is for Tina. Um, uh, what are some of the things that you could see in the foreseeable future with the Knights Creek watershed? And in particular, do you think it would be possible um, for something like a producer-like group to form or some sort of efforts amongst the farmers since there was this interconnection between them already? Actually, I'd really like to see a producer-led watershed in Knights Creek. Um, I think that I think that would only build upon what's been started out there. And I feel like in a way, it's kind of the beginning of that. Um, right now, we've got a lot of practices that are in the works. We've got a open conversation with others, but I'm hoping to just continue to grow that to other landowners. And I'm really hoping eventually we see a benefit in that dam one and the amount of sediment that's going down there. But as of right now, I, we're just continuing to work with landowners and hoping that they talk to their neighbors. Um, but it would be really, really nice. I would love to see a producer-led watershed in this watershed. That's awesome. And um, I'm going to modify that question for Chad. Do you, do you see, what do you see in the uh, foreseeable future with the tree program? For the tree program or for producer-led watersheds? <laughs> <laughs> or both, if you'd like to speak about the producer-led um, watersheds. Sure. For our tree program, I, I see some continued growth. I see a lot more people ordering smaller amounts. So like a homeowners association might just order 50 trees for an outlot or easement area. That never happened in the past. Um, a lot of the, I guess, city or um, more urbanites like I said, have been calling and making small orders and just to kind of check it out. So I guess our, our volume of customers is higher, but our trees are about the same, maybe even a little lower than they've been in the past. Um, going to uh, the other question, like a producer like group, and I'll just give, I guess, some advice. We've had a pretty good group over here for four years. Um, they, we've got about 13 members in our group. I would say eight to 10 meet regularly, like every other week or every third week. And they share ideas, they, they talk about um, other practices that, that they've had success with, and they've kind of shared some, some mistakes or some things they've noticed. So it gets everybody kind of on the same page that, you know, it's, 
you don't have to panic. You can you have neighbors and, and friends and farmers that are here to kind of walk you through uh, what they've done. So the successful guys are kind of leading the group, even though they're, they're the most quiet guys in the group. They're, they're ironically leading the group by example. And then uh, it, it's an awesome thing to have in your county if you have a producer led group. It really just builds trust between land conservation and the farmers. And yeah, those guys aren't afraid to call me up anytime. And they've added to my workload, let's put it that way, but it's a good thing. Sure. Um, and this is a question that I have, and this is something that I've noticed uh, when is one of the benefits to a lot of producer led uh, groups is that there's not just ideas sharing or information sharing and uh, different things about practices, but they also um, can recommend or share equipment. Um, is uh, particularly in the Knights Creek watershed, but um, also in Racine, like, were, was there, how, can you talk a little bit more about like access to equipment, it, either in like how it's a barrier for certain farmers to adapt uh, best management practices, or, or is there some effort to be able to connect um, people with the equipment for them to experience or ex experiment with it? Um, I would say, the, the best way to implement some of these soil health practices is just one farmer at a time. You can't get everybody to change it all at once. You kind of got to focus on guys that want to make the change. And um, sometimes the equipment's a challenge. You know, we actually have case um, in this county and they are willing to um, lease out equipment for, for nothing to some of these farmers through our producer led group, through an agreement with the group. Um, and it's just, like I said, just one farmer at a time. All of a sudden, you know, a guy will come in and he's, he's just, he's decided he's gonna make the change uh, to soil health practices and no-till cover crop systems. And that's what you need. Um, they just have to mentally make that, make that choice and make that, uh, make that change. With the, the operator that we were talking, I was talking about earlier that had the chisel plow and he really liked that we did bring up the idea that he could convert over to no-till and and he was very <laughs> very negative about that um he really thought that he didn't need to get new equipment but in dunn county we do actually have a no-till drill it's it's not it's not a very large no-till drill but it, it's good for um at least testing out different areas so producers can rent the no-till drill um so they can at least get get out there and try it. Um, we do also have a producer in the watershed that rents out some equipment um, to people and one particular they have a roller that they use to um, crush down the corn stalks because a lot of people are concerned when they convert over to no-till that when they go to combine, bo combine beans um, the corn stalks will, will jam in the combine so a lot of them are trying to roll be roll the corn um, so that they kind of break up that residue. So having that available that people can rent, they deliver it out. Um, that is definitely a benefit. Awesome. Well, thank you both. Uh, I don't have any more questions. So this is going to wrap up and conclude uh, the second session uh, for today. So another huge thank you to Chad and Tina for their presentations and and sharing all their knowledge and best of luck to both of you um, going forward. Uh, uh, if you have any more questions um, or feedback about the session, please feel free to email uh, Wisconsin Land and Water staff and we'll follow up with you accordingly. Um, and so with that, uh, the next thing that's coming up is our virtual social hour. And although obviously we can't be together um, in the spirit of our usual county con meetings, we're going to invite you to grab a beverage and join us for a fun session with our colleague and owner of Bricks Cider. So that's going to be in the next session that's coming up and it's going to be in the main room here for the final session of the day. Um, and it's entitled, Hey, you know, it's not local, that beer you're drinking. Um, and that's going to start at 3.20 PM. So we have got a little bit of a break. So do what you need to do, grab a nice cold one and um, join us again at 320. Um, you can find the appropriate Zoom link in for this, to that session, excuse me, in the virtual agenda. Um, and that also was just posted uh, 
uh, in the chat. And um, thank you so much for joining the County Con meeting. And I hope you all have a safe and wonderful summer. Take care.